All right, well, welcome back to our class, Sacrifice of Christ in the Old and New Testament. Uh, a little short tonight, but we'll pray for Brother Larry. Uh, tonight we'll be looking at uh, Sacrifice of Christ according to Matthew Mark. Uh, primarily chapters 27 and chapter 15 of Mark, but uh, we're going to actually begin in chapter 26, look at the very end of the chapter. For any of those taking notes, these are the scriptures we'll be looking at tonight. Uh, starting in Matthew 26, verses 47 through 68, then the first two verses of chapter 27, then verses 11 through 54, and 57 through 60. And I uh, have Mark's parallel passages in Mark there as well. Um, you know, I'm not trying to necessarily skip around, but I'm trying to stay on what is pertinent to our topic. You know, we got about 70 something verses there to cover tonight. Uh, we're not going to comment on every last single verse, but this covers from the betrayal all the way to the burial of Christ. Uh, my plan is to read through Matthew's gospel, and we'll insert some comments from Mark when he gives us some different detail. And by and large, Matthew and Mark's accounts are very, very similar. Well, let's go ahead and go to Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 47. If you are familiar with where we're at here, Christ had been in the garden. He'd been praying, and the disciples, they were having a hard time staying awake. It was nighttime. But verse 47 here, it says, And while he, that is Jesus, yet spake, Lo, Judas, one of the twelve, he had already left to betray him, came, and with a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then they came or then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. So here we see the betrayal and arrest of Christ. Uh, as we know Judas was filled with this devil here earlier and was sold him for thirty pieces of silver. Now, like I mentioned last week the so certainly the sacrifice of Christ really entails his entire life and all the way through to his resurrection, but primarily we're speaking of his sufferings and death here and the resurrection as well. So here really begins where his suffering starts. In the garden he was in anguish, if you will. He was suffering spiritually, mentally. And his physical suffering will begin here shortly. Uh, let's go on to the next verse. Uh, verse 51 it says, And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword. Now, this was Peter, according to John's gospel. He stretched out his sword, or he drew his sword and stretched out, or and struck a servant, excuse me, of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put away up again thy sword into his place for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword let's notice these next two verses here thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be see we notice here well Peter was a little I don't know if you want to use the word ambitious he he thought he was going to defend Christ. And certainly we ought to be willing to defend God and Christ, but he's really more than capable of defending himself. So you notice verse 53, Christ said, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Understand correctly, that would be more than twelve thousand angels. But he says, how then can, shall these scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? So I think I mentioned last week, you know, God and 
Christ himself had the power to deliver, but he really couldn't because the scriptures had to be fulfilled. You know, he had to be true to his word. He had to be true to his preordained purpose. He had to die for his people. But certainly he had the power, if, if he so chose, if I could say it that way, to deliver himself from that. You know, the, the Muslims say that Christ was a, you know, a good person, but that he wasn't God himself because God himself wouldn't allow himself to be crucified. But that's exactly what Christ did. He, for lack of a better way of putting it, he allowed them to crucify him. Let's go on to verse uh, 55 here. It says, In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are you come out against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? Or as a thief. He says, I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all his disciples forsook him and fled. They came to Christ as if he was some you know, thief or criminal. And he said, I, you know, I was with you in the temple daily. You know, Christ, they could have easily taken Christ before if they had wanted to. Oftentimes they sought to, but Christ himself made an escape. But here they come as if, like a, some mob that were going to take away this criminal. But, Isaiah says he went willingly. He went as a sheep to her shears, or the sheep to the slaughter. All this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. You know, another prophecy of Christ was in Psalms 41 9. We won't turn there, but it tells us that about the betrayal of Judas. He said that a familiar friend had lifted up his heel against him, and he that ate bread with him. It was prophesied way before Judas ever came along that he would betray Christ. Christ knew when he chose Judas that he would be the betray betrayer. It all had all had to be done that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Then all his disciples forsook him and fled. They all left Christ. They didn't stay around. You know, Peter did kind of follow from a distance, as verse 58 tells us. It says, And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, when the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off under the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. So here we see Christ carried off to the judgment place, laid to be condemned by the Jews, and then later by Pilate. But no one stood around with him, no one... There was no one there to help him, even at this point. I don't know. You know, Luke was not one of the twelve, but I don't know if he was somewhat close because he records for us some different things that none of the other gospels do. I know at the crucifixion, John was close enough that Christ could speak to him on the cross, but at this point, there was none around. Well, let's go on to the next verse, uh, verse 59. Here it says, Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet they found none. See, they, they had all these false witnesses coming against them, yet they could not find any accusation against them. Uh, Mark's gospel tells us that they couldn't agree, the false witnesses. You know, if you know under Jewish law, you had to have at least two or three witnesses. And here, you know, they had multiple ones coming, but they were they were conflicting each other. They weren't agreeing on what to accuse Christ of. But in verse, the end of verse six, he says that the last came two false witnesses, and said, "This fellow said I am not, or said I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days." Now, of course, Christ is speaking of the body, his own body in particular. 
but they thought he was speaking of the literal temple. Now, Christ could have destroyed it and built it again in three days. I, I say he could do it in about three seconds, really. He spoke this world into existence. He could certainly speak a temple into existence as well. But they would use this to accuse him of blasphemy eventually. It says, And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? Or which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And here we see again, he was as a lamb that was dumb, that was led to the slaughter. He would open not his mouth, Isaiah says. You know, he, he could have said, oh, these are false accusations. No, he could have been like us and got mad at false accusations, but yet it just says he willingly suffered what was given to him. And he says, I adjure thee, or I can I compel thee, the false priest, or the high priest, excuse me, were really by an oath is what that implies. They were commanding him to tell them, well, are you the Christ? If you remember from our reading over in Leviticus 5, if someone swear an oath and they heard it, they couldn't keep silent about it. So Christ had to answer him here, and he does in the next verse, 64. It says that Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. You know, he basically says, Yeah, you said it. You know, Mark's gospel records that he said, I am. Which is really the same. He said, Yeah, that's me. I am the Christ. You know, they still didn't believe him. Uh, I don't know why they asked him. I guess so they could get mad, because that's what happens in the next verse. But not only does he say that he is the Christ, he says, Hereafter, here in a little while, you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, or you could say the right hand of God, and coming in the clouds of heaven. And we know Christ ascended and sat down the right hand of God. Uh, Stephen himself witnessed that at his death. But one day he will come again in the clouds. So that made the high priest quite mad here. As we'll see in the next verse here, it says, Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. Well, they didn't like that Christ said, Yeah, I am the Christ. I am going to sit on the right hand of God even. And they say, we don't need witnesses, we've heard it ourselves, basically. You know, he says he rent his clothes here. You know, he was uh, violating the law in doing that. Leviticus 21.10 tells us the high priest was not to rend his clothes. So the high priest was not without fault here. <laughs> Yet he was condemning Christ of blasphemy. If Christ had not been who he was, then yeah, it would have been blasphemous. But yet he was the Christ. He was the Messiah. The one they said they were looking for, and yet they didn't believe him. And the thing I don't understand, under the law, blasphemers were to be stoned to death. But they didn't do that. Verse, 66, or excuse me, verse 66 says, What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. And certainly if he was a blasphemer, he would have been guilty of death. Verse 67 says, Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, or that is to hit him with their fist, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? You know, Mark's gospel it tells us that they covered his face while they hit him. You know, they covered his face and hit him and said, well, who was it that hit you? you know, mocking him. This at least seems to be 
partially a fulfillment of, fulfillment of what we read last week in Isaiah 50 and 6 and Psalms 22. Uh, for that, do you have a comment? Some of suppose that the Jews didn't have authority to put to death at this point because they were under the Romans. But under the law, a blasphemer was to be taken out and stoned. Yes, brother. Considered that whole lot, but the psalm that I quoted does call him friend as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I guess in a sense, Christ was his friend. He was good to him, he was friendly to him, even though he was going to betray him. Yeah, he did. He knew his hour was coming. In fact, he prayed, "Now my hour is coming." So I. Alrighty. Oh, you're fine. Any comments are ex appreciated. Like I said, here, here though, at the end of what we're looking at here, that they were mocking him, they were beating him. They were spitting on his face. You know, this was all prophesied in, in both Isaiah and the Psalms. I can't you know, imagine what restraint Christ had to have, though, to, to sit there and take it as, and not even complain or murmur. And we know he was perfect, but yet I know us in our flesh would not be so willing to take such ridicule and punishment. Certainly, he. They didn't catch him by surprise. No, they didn't. Yeah. I'm sure. Well, Christ even admitted what the ultimate temptation there would lead to him was in the first, in, in, in the early part of the very early part of what we read there in 26, that he could call angels faith. Yeah, he. That that that, that was the ultimate temptation to be there to get out. He could have, but like I said, and he said, he "Well, why?" Yeah. yeah. I think, thinking from a sinful perspective, I would be more than willing to call down twelve legions of angels to deliver me from such. Uh, sometimes I wish I could call them down for a lot less stuff than that. Yeah, like I said, he, he had the power to, but he, yeah, he had the power to, like I said, but he did, for lack of a better way, but he didn't have the ability to, I guess you could say, because then he would have broke his own word. Now, I don't, I know we. Well, I, Maybe there's a better way to put it than saying he didn't have the ability to, but I... But then he said, yeah, so not my will, but thine. So we'll get to it in a moment. I don't know that 
certainly he didn't look forward to the physical punishment, but the the spiritual punishment I think was the worst part of it. Let's go on and look at the chapter twenty seven now. Let's read the first two verses here. It says When the morning was come, they had arrested him at night time and had him there in trial overnight. When morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. They conspired against him here, if you will. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Like I said here, they, I don't know if it was because, like I said, perhaps they didn't have the authority to put to death since they were under Roman rule. So they sent him to Pilate to, they could get the Romans to do their dirty work for them. Christ predicted this would happen, though. Uh, we won't turn over there, but back in chapter 20, verse 19, he said he would be before the Gentiles in judgment. Now, verses 3 through 10 speak of the Judas, if you want to call it repentance, and his suicide, and his hanging himself, and then him being buried. So, I'm going to skip over those and go down to verse 11 for time's sake. And it says, verse 11, And Jesus stood before the governor, that is Pilate, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. Just like he said before, you know, that's, that's me basically, you said it. Verse 12 says, And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him, or he answered him to never a word, insomuch that he, the governor marveled greatly. Here, once again, we see Christ, you know, dumb, if you will, as the scripture says, as a lamb that is dumb was led to the slaughter, and he opened it not his mouth. The flesh's impulse, at least a sinful flesh's impulse, would be to say, no, that wasn't me, I didn't do that. Or either falsely accusing me. Yet Christ knew what had to happen, and he willingly submitted himself to it, as we, Brother Adam pointed out, all the way back in the Garden of Gethsemane there. Let's go on to verse 15. It says, Now at the feast, the governor was wont or was known to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a noble pri or notable prisoner called Barabbas. You know, that was their custom to release a prisoner, at the very least at Passover, possibly at some other feast times as well. And so they had a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Now Mark's Gospel tells us that he was an insurrectionist and killed someone during the insurrection. You know, insurrection is a revolt or a riot. John's gospel says that he was a robber or or a plunderer is what that means. So you know, he was a lot like some of these people we have in our day. He was rioting, plundering, stealing, and he even killed someone in the process. He was a very outstanding citizen, if you ask some people. Yet here the choice was given, do you want this, you know, the lowest of low, if you will, or do you want Jesus? Verse 17 says, Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. You don't know if Pilate thought they would change their mind, or they would, you know, Say, well, no, we don't really want Barabbas. But no, you know, Pilate, I don't know what his at thinking was. He was, seemed like he was always trying to take the, the easy way out, though. <clears throat> he didn't, he said he didn't want to, you know, punish Christ, but yet he never really sought opportunity to. He always pass the book if you will so well, here I'll, I'll give them this criminal or Jesus and they'll certainly they'll choose Jesus 
No, left to ourselves, the natural man will never choose Jesus, will he? Uh, let's go on to verse 19 here. It says, And when he was set down on the judgment seat, that's Pilate, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. If there's nothing else we could, should maybe take that. Sometimes we ought to listen to the advice of our wives, huh? You know, she had. She said, "I've suffered a lot in a dream because of him." I, you know, I don't know that God still speaks through dreams or not. That's a different topic for another time. But certainly, He has spoke to people in dreams, and He did to this woman here. She said. She calls him a just man and says, you know, you have nothing to do with him. The pilot, once again, not being very bold, he always gave or gave up to the people. He always gave in to the people. I mean, first. Certainly, yeah, no, I get what you're saying. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I don't. Cer certainly, Satan knows a lot more than we do. Uh, at first, I'm sure he thought, well, yeah, I've got him defeated. But at some point along the way, whether it was here or later, he realized, well, no, that wasn't the right thing to do, was it? That wasn't the, that didn't have the effect I thought it was going to have. And yeah, certainly for Pilate, it would have been to his benefit to listen to the words of his wife here. But. If there's, yeah. But there is one thing we can take away from Judas, if nothing else, is when the devil gets done with you, you know, you're pretty used up. Uh, let's go ahead and read verse 20 here. It says, But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. They didn't want Jesus. Even you know, Pilate's plan A would backfire here, I guess you could say. Verse 21 says, The governor answered and said unto them, Whether the twain will I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they said, Well, okay, I'll give you Barabbas. What do you want me to do with uh, Jesus over here? And they said unto they all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And crucifixion was not the law's way of death, but it was the Romans' way of death. It was almost as if they were in a riot here. They were, in fact, I think it's in Mark and, and Luke, tell us they cried the more, even the more, the second time, Crucify him, crucify him. Verse 23, it says, And the governor said, What, why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Pilate was correct in his assessment of Christ. He had done no evil. Well, even back at the, the Jews' little trial they had of him, they couldn't find any fault in him until they made up something against him. But here, what evil hath he done? Christ was the spotless Lamb of God, wasn't he? He was without sin. 
I'm convinced if Christ were to come today, the cry would still be the same, though. They would want, we would want to put him to death by whatever means that we chose. Let him be crucified. Crucify him, crucify him, as Luke says. Let's go on to verse 24. It says, When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made. You know, Pilate, he might have pushed a little bit, but he didn't try it real hard to release Christ. When he saw the people, when he saw the, the crowd, if you will, and he said, you know what, I, I'm not going to try anymore. He took the easy way out, if you will. Now, we, we know it was the purpose and plan of God that he, Christ would be delivered up and crucified, but from Pilate's perspective, he was really didn't do a very good job of trying to release Christ. He was always willing, always giving in to the people. It says, rather a tumult was made. They were you know, stirring stuff up, if you will. Certainly if he had said, well, no, I'm going to release Christ, there were, probably would have been rioting and protesting and whatnot. And Pilate didn't want to deal with all that controversy. It says he, speaking of Pilate, took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Uh, he said, basically he washed his hands and said, uh, you know, that his blood's not on me. It's on y'all. Really, cry, really, Pilate was still guilty, but... Verse 25, they then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and, all, and our children. And certainly it was on them. Uh, we don't have to turn there, but Acts chapter 5, verse 28, they were singing a different tune. Uh, when the disciples were preaching Christ, when they were saying, Yeah, the Jews, they crucified him, they were saying, Whoa, why are you preaching this? We don't want his blood on us. You, know, you have to be careful what you say in the moment. We, we in the flesh tend to sp easily speak by emotion rather than rational thought, and I think that's kind of what was happening here with the Jews. They were riled up. They were saying, "Yeah, crucify him! Crucify him!" You know, his blood be on us. Uh, I don't know if later on they thought, well, maybe that wasn't the best thing to do, but. We see here, the natural man never wanted Christ, did they? The natural man re rejected him, then falsely accused him, then beat him, and then put him to death. And yet, somehow, the natural man is supposed to choose Jesus today. Or, as I seen one person with a shirt that said, pick Jesus. Well, left to ourselves, we would be just like the Jews here. And say, away with this man. Verse 26 says, Then he released Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And I think this verse shows that verse 24 wasn't really sincere. Pilate washed his hands and said, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. Then in verse 26, he beat him. Scourged him means to whip him, to lash him, to flog him. You know, it's said that. The Romans use that device called a cat of nine tails, which literally ripped the hide from your back. You know, this was the second time Christ was beaten. He was by the Jews, and then here. At this point, he was no doubt weak. He had been up all night. He had been you know, tossed around at these different trials. And here they would deliver him to be crucified it says well, let's go on to verse 27 it says then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus in the common hall and gathered on him the whole band of soldiers here they surrounded him once again and mocked him it says in verse 28 and they stripped him and put on a, a scarlet gar robe uh, I think Mark's gospel says it was a purple robe. 
the way it was a sign of royalty is what it was supposed to indicate. In verse 29 it says, And when they had played a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they said it, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they mocked him once again. They fashioned up this, they got this robe and put on him. They gave him this reed that was supposed to be as a, like a king's scepter. And they made him this crown. And so they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. I can't imagine that crown of thorns felt very good in the head. Yeah, I'm sure that. I'm sure that between the sticking them in and the blood pouring down, he was beginning to have his visage marred, as we saw in Isaiah. Verse 30 says, and they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. So once again, they spit up, spit on him again. I don't know too many people that would just stand there and take someone spitting in their face, but yet Christ willingly took it. And it says they, they took the reed and spoke him on the head. So not only did he have this crown of thorns on, but then they smacked him on the head, no doubt driving him in even further. At this point, he was pretty battered and beat up, if you will. And in verse 31 it says that after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him, put his own raiment on, and led him away to crucify him. So after they made fun of him and mocked him, they took the stuff back, or at least the the garment. And they wouldn't want to mess up a scarlet robe. And they led him away, and I think it's in Luke that says he was led with the two thieves as well. Let's go on to verse 32 here. And let's it says, And they came out, as they came out of the city there, of Jerusalem. If you remember from our studying the sacrifices, they they were to take the outside the camp. Uh, the New Testament describes Christ as being crucified outside the gate, he was outside of Jerusalem. Because that is where sin had to be dealt with. Outside the camp was where were stone people. I think even go ahead. Yeah, lepers were to be outside the camp. I think even when they stoned Stephen, they took him, they ran him outside the camp. But we see they came out and they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And Christ was so worn down at this point that he could not even carry the cross himself well this I was told Adam I would often get off on little rabbit trails while I'm studying and I was wondering where Cyrene was from what I can tell it was in northeast Libya modern day northeast Libya close to a city we're all familiar with called Benghazi For those who aren't familiar, Libya is east of Egypt, so it's there in northern Africa. So Mark's gospel tells us his children's name, that they were Alexander and Rufus. It's possible that this Rufus is the same Rufus of Romans 16, 13, and it's suggested that this Alexander is the same Alexander of Acts 19:33. Don't have anything to prove that, but Mark's gospel was written during the time that they would have been prominent in the church. And perhaps he made note of them that their own father carried the cross of Christ. It says in verse 33, And they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull. It was called Golgotha, or the place of the skull, either because there were many skulls laying around from all the victims or because it looked like a skull. There, 
are some hills over there in Jerusalem that have appearance of a skull on the side of them. Well, there was something, though, that resembled a skull there, so they called it Golgotha. Now, we often use the term Calvary. We'll look at that next week when we go to Luke. He's the one who pins the term Calvary instead of Golgotha for us. It says, They gave him, verse 34, vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. Now, this vinegar was possibly a, a wine-based vinegar because Mark's gospel tells us it, calls it wine, calls it a sour wine. And it says mingled with gall, and again, Mark's gospel says mingled with myrrh. Myrrh was a, a perfume, if you will. It smelled good, but it didn't taste very good. You know, gall is in another, word, another word for bitterness. In fact, uh, I don't remember where it's at. The New Testament speaks of the gall of bitterness. You know, we have the gallbladder, which the same word comes from. But whatever it was that was mixed in here, it was a bitter drink. You know, I can't imagine being so weak and worn down, and then you get this bitter taste in vinegar to drink. Yeah, myrrh in particular was had antiseptic properties to it. So that's what Mark's gospel calls it. He would be given vinegar again later on the cross, but here he tasted it and he said he would not drink. Verse uh, 35 says, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They did, they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Well, this is a fulfillment of Psalms 22, 16, and verse 18, where it says they, you know, it says in the Psalms they parted my garments and cast a lot upon my vesture. Well, there in Psalms it also says that they pierced his hands and his feet, and that was they crucified him. Verse 36 says, And sitting down they watched him there, and set upon over his head his accusation written, or his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Well, Mark's Gospel simply says, The King of the Jews. Uh, Matthew seems to have the most comprehensive title, if you will, that was put on the cross. But certainly it was a true accusation, wasn't it? This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Yeah, he wasn't the king they would thought they were going to get, though. I'm sure they were expecting some king like David or Saul, even come, good-looking fellow, come down in here and take over the kingdom for him. And Christ was not a good-looking fellow, the scriptures tells us. And he probably was a quite fit compared to American standards, but being a carpenter, but. He was not good to look upon, apparently. And he was their king, but not in the way they anticipated. His kingdom was not of this world, he says in another place. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. You know, I, my personal thought is that along with the prayer of Christ, led to the conversion of the thief on the cross. I, as far as we know, the thief never saw Jesus before the cross. Yeah, they, I'm sure they had heard of him, and here they saw him. <laughs> Let's go uh, on to verse 38 here. It says, and there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. 
And this fulfills Isaiah 53, 12 to tell us he was numbered with the transgressors. And he was the spotless, perfect, sinless Lamb of God, and yet he was you know, hanging there between two thieves. You know, I, I hope I didn't offend anybody with my picture on the beginning slide of the three crosses there, but you know, I certainly don't worship the crucifix as some do, but if there were three crosses on the hill that day, and Christ is right there in the midst of it. It says right in the middle. Verse 39 says, And they passed by, or they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. This is a fulfillment once again of Psalms 22, particularly verses 7 and 8. And they shook their heads down, they stuck out the lip, they mocked him. They wagged their heads and saying, verse 40, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it up in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. The thing is, he would destroy the temple and build it back up in three days. Just not in the way they thought. And they see, they say, If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priest, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. You know, they wouldn't have believed him. They, they didn't believe him when he told them, I am the Christ. Well, I don't know why they were going to believe him now. They would have probably said, he has a devil. That's what <laughs> yeah. and Christ answered him back then and said, well, does Satan cast himself out? So, you know, I know they they said we would believe him, but I highly doubt they would have believed him. To believe in, to truly believe Christ, you had to have faith, and they didn't have faith. Not even one little iota of it. Verse 43, in particular, echoes the words in Psalms. 22 it says he trusted in God let him deliver him now if he will have him for he said I am the son of God and who are they and said, well he trusted in God well, let's see if God will deliver him really God would deliver him but it just was going to be three days later it says he saved others himself he cannot save yet what they didn't realize is he was in the very process of saving countless number of souls there on the cross. The Jews had a problem where they always wanted to see things. They were too physical, if you will, in their service for God. The Jews require a sign, what Paul said. Yet, without faith, they couldn't understand who he was what he was even doing. The prophets that spoke of this, the prophets had pointed to Christ all this time, and yet here he was, and they couldn't even see it. The natural man is blind to the things of God, unless they be revealed unto him. Let's go on to our next verse, verse 44. It says, the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. So the thieves that were there also, they, they mocked him. And eventually the one would not mock him and would say, you know, as the Brother Junior pointed out, he would say, this man has done nothing to miss. But it seems at this point they were both mocking him. Verse 45 says, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. So for about three hours here, there was darkness over the land, it says. You know, I don't know if, how God accomplished this, if it was an eclipse or what, but in my opinion, I guess you could say, this was when God turned his back to Christ. When God turns his back, darkness comes. And maybe that's not the best phrasing, but that's the only way I know how to put it, that God turned his back to Christ. At this point, Christ had became sin for us, and God could not look upon that sin. 
Verse 46 says, In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Now I might mess this up, so forgive me. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Remember, this is an exact wording as we saw in Psalms 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Verse 47, let's read that. It says, Some of them that stood there when he had, when they had heard that said, This man called for Elias, or, which is Elijah. If you, I know Brother Junior weren't here, but y'all were listening. I did ask if y'all could think about why they thought he called for Elias. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. I have two theories on that. One possible theory is that they misunderstood what he said because in the original language these words are very similar uh, you know Eli or how we would say it said Eli and Elias is Eli is in the Greek even in the Hebrew they they sound similar as well but another possible explanation though is they were just further mocking him. You know, well, he's calling for Elijah. Let's see if Elijah comes and helps him now. Yeah, that's why words in the sound very similar, is it? This Eli and the Elias. It says Eli is a Chaldee version of the Chaldee, however you say that, version of the Hebrew. Yes, Elias here is the Greek version of Elijah. And they do sound very similar. And I'm sure the Jews, not being very familiar with the scriptures, apparently. Yeah. Well, I know the uh, the Jews now uh, they have a certain time uh, in calendar or some kind of uh, they have something in there that they always put an empty plate at the table and uh, they wait for Elijah to come and knock on the door. Yeah, Elijah was to come before Christ. Yeah. He did come. His name was John the Baptist. Yeah. He came in the spirit of Elijah. He was not Elijah reincarnated, but he did have the, the spirit of Elijah was upon him, the scripture says. <laughs> so I don't know what they were thinking. Well, if he's the Christ and Elijah still got to come and save him. But either which way, it says here that in verse 48, straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. So again, we see the vinegar. And from my understanding here, the sponge on a reed was also what they used to clean themselves after going to the bathroom. So, I mean, perhaps it was a clean one, but yet it was an insultuous way to give him a drink. The rest said, let B, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. And they said, well, let's see if, just let him be, let him be alone, or leave him alone, if you will, and we'll see if Elijah comes down and saves him. Well, in my estimation, verse 46 is probably the, the worst of the sufferings of Christ. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For the, you know, for the first time, if you will, the, there was a separation there between Christ and the Father. Well, I, I know the physical sufferings were bad and more than we could bear, I'm sure. But the the spiritual sufferings, if you will, they were you know, probably a thousand times greater. He said he cried with a loud voice. We do have 
seven things that it said that Christ said on the cross. None of them were very long. But, uh, one of them is here in Matthew and Mark. And Luke records three different ones, and John records three different ones. It was around here in verse 48 when he said, I thirst. And they would they gave him the, the vinegar to drink. And he was dried up, the psalm says. His, he would say his tongue cleaved to his mouth. Like I said, I can't imagine what that vinegar would be the thing to quench your thirst at that point. I've no, I'm not a particular liking the vinegar as a drink. So some people, I know they like to take a shot of apple cider vinegar, but I don't think any of them say, oh yeah, that was delicious. Oh, of all, vinegar was not a, a a pleasant drink even in this day. Let's go on to verse 50 here. It says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And here we see the death of Christ, and it was voluntary. It says he yielded up the ghost. You know, certainly the Jews were guilty, if you will, but yet they did not directly kill Christ. He gave it up himself. He laid down his life, he himself said. And he said, you know, if he laid down his life, he had power to take it up again. Verse 51 says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the veil that separated the Holy of Holies, it says it was rent. And if you notice there, it was from top to bottom. And God himself rented. Tore it in two, if you will. And God himself gave us direct access to him through the person of Christ. There was no more need for the ceremonies to cleanse yourself and to make yourself worthy to enter the temple and then again to enter into the holies of holies. We know through the person of Christ we can enter directly into the throne of grace, Hebrew says. And there was a great earthquake here it says that the rocks rent, the rocks split in two from the earthquake. In verse 52, 53 say, And the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now some would say that this is all the Old Testament saints. I'm not sure. It doesn't give us much detail here, and Matthew's the only one who records it for us. But no, the graves were open, and it, it says they were open, but they didn't come out until after his resurrection. Now, the reason for that was Christ was to be the first fruits of the resurrection. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, He's the first fruits of them which sleep. Uh, Colossians 1, 18 says, He is the first one of the dead, that he might all things have the preeminence. And then again in Acts 26, 23, says that he should be the first to rise from the dead. Now certainly Christ was not the first person to be resurrected. We know he resurrected several. Uh, Elijah did. Uh, Elias did. But he was the first one to be resurrected unto eternal life. To eternal glory, if you will. My thinking on these saints that they they were glorified and taken on to heaven with him when he went to heaven. It does say that they came out after his resurrection and they appeared unto many. All these things witnessed to the that he was the Christ. You know, I don't know how many people the Romans crucified, but I can guarantee you none of them had the same effect that Jesus had. When the two other thieves died, nothing really special happened, did it? But when Jesus died on the cross there, the veil of the temple was rent, the earth did quake, and the graves were open, it says. I can't imagine how great an earthquake it had to be to 
split the rocks in two. And I, based on the wording here, I <coughs> wonder, I think that the, the earthquakes would open the graves, probably too. Now I know their their graves were usually a, you know, tombs that were hewn out of rock, and as Christ's tomb was, a big stone was rolled in front of it. Verse fifty four says, "Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus, they the Romans had put a guard there for whatever reason." It says, saw the earthquake and those things w that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly this was the Son of God. And I don't think this was any type of profession of salvation, but even the centurion knew that something was different about Christ. You know, as a Roman soldier, I'm sure he had seen many crucifixions, but this one was different. Perhaps he realized that Christ was innocent of the charges that was against him. Truly, this was the Son of God. He certainly said very true words there. Let's go on. Let's go up on down to verse 57 here. I want to look at uh, his burial. Verse 57 says, And when the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea, which Arimathea was uh, the Greek word for Ramah, by the way. Which, <laughs> there was a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus, and then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb which he had hewn out of the rock and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed well, here verse 59 or in 60 we see the fulfillment of Isaiah 53 9 which says he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death he was buried in a rich man's tomb he was buried among the wicked men of the world Obviously, though, not to be there forever, though. Only for three days. You know, Mark's gospel tells us that Pilate was surprised that Christ was dead already. He even had one of his soldiers go verify that he was dead. You know, normally, I know Christ suffered greatly there on the cross. But normally, they were there for a while. Yeah, they wanted to get him off there for the Sabbath day because that was the custom of the Jews not to leave one there on Sabbath day. And yeah, that's another reason why it's probably called the place of the skull, or probably some skulls laying around there. You know, the as the other gospels record for us that, or at least I think it's John's gospel, tells us they broke the legs of the two thieves. You know, cause but Christ was dead already at that point. Well, he would, he had suffered greatly wait, the whole night and morning before the cross, and certainly, physically speaking, the cross was about more than we could have ever bore. Yep, it says Pilate, or it says, excuse me, Joseph here. He took him, he wrapped him in a linen, clean linen cloth and laid him in his own new tomb. Mark calls Joseph an honor, honorable counselor. Now, I don't, we're not told much about Joseph Arimathea, but we, I do want to give you one homework assignment to look at. If you look in Luke's gospel, you'll find the answer. He was indirectly mentioned before the burial of Christ. See if you can find where I'm speaking of. We'll look at it, Lord willing, next week. But he was 
You know, he wasn't laid in a used tomb, it says he was laid in a new tomb. He wasn't. They rolled this great stone in the door of the sepulchre, and we know the rest of the passage, the rest of the chapter here tells us that the Romans put guards at the door. You know, I guess they thought, or I guess the Jews thought that the disciples would come and take away the body of Christ. And they says they still say that that's what happened. But we know that that's not what happened. I don't remember if it's Luke or John's gospel tells us that Nicodemus gave spices for his, or gave ointment for his preparation of his body. But he didn't need those. He really didn't need them, did he? And they went down there to do it, and he was already resurrected, already in a glorified state. That great stone couldn't hold him in there. Well, if we have no other comments, we'll go ahead and close. You got anything, brother? I think he brought it at his burial. I, I will study it out a little bit, but I was thinking that he gave it to the women there. The women were sitting there at the tomb. The women took it and made ready to prepare his body. All right, well, our next lesson will be Sacrifice of Christ according to Luke, and primarily be chapter 23. I. Since Luke wrote the book of Acts, there's at least one verse I think I might look at as well. <laughs> right, if nothing else, we'll close then.